simple songwriting is kind of like uh, trying to produce an egg, you know, it, it doesn't happen instantaneously. This is Live at the Hall from the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. This week, Michael Gray talks with singer-songwriter and member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, John Sebastian. I've wanted to sing this in this town for ever so long. Well, there's 1,352 guitar pickers in Nashville. And they can pick more notes than the number of ants on the Tennessee Ant Hill. Yeah, there's 1,352 guitar cases in Nashville. And anyone that unpacks a guitar can play twice as better than I will. Yes, I was just 13. You might say it was a musical proverbial knee high. When I heard a couple of new sounding tunes on the tube, and they blasted me sky high. And the record man said, everyone is a yellow sun record from Nashville. And up north, here ain't nobody buys them. And I said, but I will. And it was Nashville cats playing clean as country water. Nashville cats playing wild as Mountain Dew. Nashville cats been playing since these babies. Nashville cats get work before bed too. Come on, play me a break here. Well, there's 16,821 mothers from Nashville. All her friends play music and they ain't uptight if one of the kids will. Cause when it's custom made for any mother's son to be a guitar picker in Nashville. And I sure am glad I got a chance to say a word about the music and the mothers from Nashville. And them Nashville cats playing clean as country water. Nashville cats playing wild as Mountain Dew. Nashville cats been playing since they's babies. Nashville cats it worked before that too. Here we go. Welcome, John Sebastian, to the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum, and thank you for being a part of our Live at the Hall series. Well, thank yeah. you so much. I'm honored to be with you. Yeah. Well, so um, the last time I saw you, your pal Al Anderson of NRBQ yeah. brought you through our major exhibition, Dylan Cash and the Nashville Cats. Yes. And, um, the, uh, we just launched um, a, a major online version of that exhibit. I see. And, you know, and in the exhibit, of course, we talked about the song you wrote, Nashville Cats, and how it was a big hit for The Love and Spoonful in 1966, and how it really, that's how that phrase caught on and became a, you know, a, a catchphrase for the, for the Nashville musicians around here. So, so, so funny to me. I thought, for sure, they must be calling them that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, what, can you talk about how, how you came to write that song? Well, uh, uh, you know, The Love and Spoonful played Nashville, and uh, me and Yanofsky were kind of like a miniature motorcycle gang, and so we'd kind of get around as much as we could, and we were feeling pretty good about the show we did, and it was in front of the folks from Nashville, and, you know, really, The Spoonful... Uh, if if there was anybody that was more important than the Beatles, it was Buck Owens and the Buckaroos. And Yanofsky always used to say, uh, you know, I, I want us to sound like Buck Owens and the Buckaroos only with Elmore James as the lead singer. I said, boy, that would be a good band. Yeah. Yeah. So was it, I, I, I'd heard a story that you had saw Danny Gatton performing in Nashville. Is that, uh, is, is that what inspired you to? That's right, yes, yeah. So the Spoonful finished their, uh, their gig 
we go back to the hotel. There's a little beer bar in the basement, and we go down there, and we're having a beer. And this guy walks in, old Telecaster, sits down and just starts playing. And me and Yanofsky looked at each other in horror. This guy was so amazing. And he's playing all kind of thumb-picking Chet atkins stuff that then gets sort of jazzier. And I know that later they called it hillbilly jazz. Uh, but he just did 20 minutes of... I don't even know if he knew that we were such fans of the style, at least. But he did his little set and packed up and left. And it left me and Yanofsky going, so why is this guy here? And we just played the biggest joint in, in the town. And we were going, long hair? I mean, <laughs> it isn't our picking skills. So uh, it was just one of those wonderful, uh, wonderful exchanges that then uh, by a, a week later, I was starting to write the song. And of course, those odd numbers in the song were totally to entertain Zalyanovsky. That was why 1600 and so on was funny. And uh, that was uh, that was sort of a a focal point of the song. And uh, years later, uh, one of your contemporaries uh, came to me and said, you know, we did a little research over at the Musicians Union and you were only about 300 guitar players off. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I just love that. Yeah, I was gonna ask you where the numbers came from. Yeah, so they're just yeah. arbitrary. They just had to sound awkward. <laughs> yes. Um, you, uh, you know, one thing I've always wondered is, um, like, had you, ever, had you already heard the term Nashville Cats? Was that something that was being, you know, bounced around in the community and you picked that up and ran with it and wrote a song? Or did you actually kind of come up with that phrase? Yes, I had heard the phrase, but mostly back east because we would very often say, oh man, like, oh, what are we having trouble with? These, those Nashville cats could come in and cut this in two minutes and have it done. And that was sort of our, that's the superlative is the Nashville cats. And, and that's just because of the people we were hearing playing guitar here. Uh, it's such a remarkable variety and, and uh, so that was really the that was really the source of the idea. Yeah. So the the Love and Spoonful were a self-contained band. You didn't you guys that's didn't use right. a lot of session that's players. That's right. Thank you. Please. So, so that's you play and that's right. Pedal that, steel. That, that, that's right. There's no hell blame on that nonsense. No. <laughs> um, since you play pedal steel on um, on the song Nashville Cats, did uh, how long had you been playing steel? About you know? twenty minutes. <laughs> You really were just learning it on the fly for that session? I tell you what, I did not own one. But one of the things that would happen in New York studios is that at that time the company was Carol Musical Instruments, would very often have a set of marimbas or a, a set of tom-toms and something that they were going to pick up. Well, the spoonful would always go, hey marimba <laughs> what what can we put on that you know what can we put that on and the the pedal steel just it just happened at the right time it was in the studio and uh so i was just experimenting and and it was the most rudimentary i, I think it was a fender um so in the process of recutting this because we did this with with Tony Jackson, um, I'm going to do the dumb chicka dumb chicka, so I know what my job is. And Paul Franklin comes in and uh, says, "So, uh, what did you did you use a Fender uh, seventh string?" He knew exactly what I'd used, and he said, "So what? You just put push him down the pedal?" I said, "That's right. That's I didn't know how to do anything else." So. It was hilarious to hear Paul Franklin <laughs> to take the same the same song, and all of a sudden it just becomes a magical thing. You know? yeah. So that was great fun. Yeah. 
One of the Nashville cats that you did record with, but not in Nashville, in Los Angeles, was primo Nashville cat, uh, the pedal steel player Buddy oh, Emmons. Man. Yeah, yes. he had just moved out to California like in 1968 when you were starting to make your first solo records. What, what, do you do you recall that session and how? Oh, I absolutely recall every minute of it because it was so singular to have managed to get Buddy. Uh, you know, we didn't ever think that he'd move to Los Angeles or any of that stuff. We didn't know that. But Paul Rothschild, to his credit, a wonderful producer who did my records and Doors records and Janis Joplin records, said, well, where's Buddy Emmons? <laughs> I went, are you kidding? We, we can't afford the high priced spread. And he goes, well, let's call him the number was in his phone book and uh and buddy came down and he was so gracious it it just stunned us to just to be exposed to a little southern gentlemanly approach to a session which was so different than los angeles okay let's go let's go well, wait a minute <laughs> Okay, ready to go, you know, and, and here's this guy who comes in, sets this elaborate instrument up and is ready to go. And in fact, while he was tuning, his tuning was so amazing that the engineer punched the button just to hear him tune. Because, you know, that's all of that motorcycle gear stuff and, and, and fine. Oh, it's a... Uh, yeah, if you you could know just enough about tuning a guitar to get in trouble, yeah. Yeah, and, and of course I don't know if I mentioned the track, but it was "Rainbows All Over Your Blues." Rainbows all over your blues, yeah. and and uh, I changed I did change the lyric. I changed the word to say, uh, you know. So Buddy and I came up here to sing you a tune, and Buddy was so delighted that I had name checked him. Uh, that uh, he he repeated the story uh, a lot of times. I'd, I'd hear it come back at me that that he was touched by the fact that I used his name. Yeah, you know, and that, again, that was 19, it was recorded in 68, and I've heard a lot of um, young, younger people who kind of came to country music through rock yeah. who kind of cited that song as like, like got them interested in, in the pedal steel guitar and country oh, music. Interesting. And, you know, and, and, and all that so yeah who could ever predict <laughs> right right well, well john i wanted to go um you know back back to your upbringing there in greenwich village um in new york i know your dad was a very important um harmonica player in classical music orchestras that's right of, um, that's right he was a virtuoso yeah and then this was a time when people weren't used to hearing harmonica in oh classical thank you music. <laughs> indeed yeah, yeah. yeah the world at that time really was the harmonic cats and you know thinking of the the harmonica as a kind of a it's a kind of a funny instrument and you wear uh, big ch chaps big furry chaps and you know uh, wonderful uh, musician about this tall that that was the I, I'm spacing on his name but he used to come by our house. I mean, I, I knew the guy, but. Uh, yeah, did, did your dad encourage you in, in your own music, in your music career? You know, dad had a great attitude, which was uh, he had had great success in, in school. And uh, magna cum laude at Haverford and so on. But he said, you know, when I went to see all my old school friends, that now were about my age and had a kid or so on, they were already pushing the kid towards law. I was so afraid, my dad said, of doing that to any of my children because first of all, you know, classical harmonica, that's two strikes, as he said. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I guess in my mind, like, you know, we're talking about the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Uh, in my mind, like the classical world and the folk blues world are like separate. But your dad ended up introducing you to a lot of your heroes, Yes, right? indeed. Like and like and Hoppin. it really started out with uh, having a friendship with Sonny Terry because 
he would do these harmonica symposium shows that would include a classical harmonica player, my dad, a blues harmonica player, Sonny Terry, uh, and then a few uh, uh, other of the kind of harmonicat type type uh, groups. Yeah. And and your dad also introduced you to Lightning Hopkins, right? Weren't they on a TV show together? Yes, that's right. You've done your research because <laughs> there was uh, a pretty, I guess I was about 18, when dad did a show called Robert Harridge Presents. And it was a Sunday kind of, uh, it had the flavor of educational television before there really was educational television. But the cast of, uh, of the, the, the uh, people on the variety show were my dad, Lightning Hopkins, uh, a, a, a Welsh actor whose name I'm missing, and Joan Baez at about 17, wow. barefoot, the whole trip. And I had already met Joan because I went to summer camp that included a lot of people from where she grew up, so I knew her best friend and her sister's best friend. So I had never really been able to approach her, though, because she was sort of, she had this kind of aura about her of magnificence that you didn't want to invade on. And I'm watching Lightning Hopkins sing, just to keep on rubbing it that. And she's laughing and breaking up, and I, that's the effect I want to have on somebody that cool. And so uh, at the end of the show, as uh, good nights were being uh, made, I picked up Sam's guitar case, and when he turned to look at me, I said, Mr. Hopkins, uh, I know the subway system and I, I can get us down within three blocks of the club you're playing. I know the club because it's six blocks from my house. So, and in fact, if you wanted to stay there, you could stay there. Well, he had somehow gotten the word through Sonny <laughs> that we were all right. You know, it was just like that. Uh, and uh, so, indeed, he came downtown with me, and, and uh, I just I became a lead boy for a guy that wasn't blind. Wow. That's fantastic. Well, one, one other story I wanted to ask you about that period is um, that uh, the story about Woody Guthrie spending the night <laughs> on your living room yeah, floor. Yeah, it's, it's too bad because I, I wish more... Uh, uh, could be made of the story, but I was only about five. I mean, I just know from the house we were in that it was still pretty early. Uh, a little house, a little apartment on Bank Street, which probably flooded during our recent floods. So my dad was a very good cook. Actually, so was my mom. But uh, there was a lot of dining in at dad's house. And uh, one of the frequent guests was Burl Ives, uh, just beginning a career in uh, folk singing. You know, he hadn't really, I don't think, done any acting even yet. But he came to my dad at a certain point and he said, you know, Johnny, uh, I got a friend and uh, nobody knows him. He's kind of kind of disheveled looking guy, but he's going to be the next great American songwriter. But he needs a place to stay for a week or so. Dad said, well, there's a, we've got a guest room, and the guest room was pretty much adjoining where I had my sort of, I don't know, was barely out of a crib. I mean, I was little. And, you know, of an evening, Woody would sometimes take the instrument out. And, Have you heard that vigilante man? And I'd be listening, and I remember thinking, because I used to hear Dad rehearse eight hours a day. And I listened to Woody Guthrie, and I said, not as good as my dad. <laughs> That was all I had at five. Yeah. <laughs> well, good son. You're a good son. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So John, you know, with the, with the spoonful, you incorporated auto harp into 60s pop and rock on these massive hits. Yes. Um, that's not something people were hearing every day. Um, I'm interested, when did you start playing auto harp? I Who were you owe, listening to? I owe the whole auto harp thing to two sisters, uh, Susan and Wendy Robinson, again, who were at this summer camp, and they were a little further into the Massachusetts folk music thing. They were buddies with Joan and Mimi, and, and they knew everybody and the folk singers around Harvard Square and all of that. When did you start thinking, okay, I can play auto harp on, on rock and roll records and, and, and kind of the, right, when yeah. did it gel? When did the love, when did it gel with the, with the love and spoonful kind of combining acoustic music, with electric music? When did, can you right. kind of talk about how all that came together? Yeah. All right. So having these pals who were further into folk music, they began playing records by the Carter family and uh, uh, they also played auto harp. And so I began to borrow the instrument and try to figure it out and didn't make too much progress on it, but it did, it did hit me that this was, a, this was an instrument that had something. And it was several years later uh, in the basement of the Albert Hotel where there was, a, there was an afternoon where I had the basement to myself. So I was trying to learn Heat Wave by Martha and the Vandellas. Well, if you take a careful look at Do You Believe in Magic, you will find a certain similarity of chordal pattern in that song. And so here I am, I'm finding the chords. Now they didn't exist on the instrument by themselves, but I had spent pretty much a lifetime listening to piano tuners. So I went, okay, if this was a minor seventh uh, instead of a major seventh, it would fit this pattern. And so would this other one be better if I made it a minor seventh? And so that was really, once I had those two chords uh, added to the normal one, four, five uh, uh, pattern, I had the framework and uh, the song came about uh, totally because the Spoonful was playing a kind of a folk club that really had never had rock and roll. And so on this one evening when we were over playing for sure, in the back of the room we saw a young woman dancing, but she was dancing our way. She wasn't doing the Lindy Bop or any whatever. And that was like, yes, we have a chance. And indeed, a week later, <laughs> there were more girls from Queens show up than I could have shook a stick at. Wow. You, know, you know, speaking of Do You Believe in Magic with that Motown connection with, yes. with, with Heat Wave, um, I also um, know that you wrote um, uh, Daydream while you were on the bus with the Supremes? Yes. Yeah, what, what yes. do you remember about writing that song, Daydream? Well, uh, that again, that was a, a very much a Yanofsky uh, sort of a stimulus because uh, he, he, all of a sudden he just decided one day, he said, man, you're, you're out of style now. You, you, you've, you're out, you've blown it. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, like, you're playing these old beats and you know, nobody really cares. And geez, what, what do you think we should be doing? He goes, well, what about like the beat of baby love? It's very even. There isn't much of a big backbeat on that song. It's doom, doom, doom. And the pianist is mashing it on straight eights. And really, that was my point of departure, was uh, where did our love go or baby love? Those were still that same thing where you can hear. And the vibraphone in the background of all of those songs 
was also kind of informative for the auto harp. You didn't make the connection directly, but there was something about that shingle jingle of the auto harp that resembled some of those upper register uh, chords that the the the, the uh, vibra uh, vibra harpist would would play. Wow! And t so, and you, were you literally like sitting on a tour bus with the Supremes and their band when when you started writing the the music out for that song? Maybe, or, not. I, maybe not. I I don't know if I could come up with the exact timing because sometimes, as you know, songwriting is kind of like. Uh, trying to produce an egg, you know, it, it doesn't happen instantaneously. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, were, you, were, you were touring the, the Chitlin circuit with the Supreme? Well, it yeah. was the, the summer that, that the Spoonful opened for the Supremes was a wonderful moment for everybody because we each wanted the other's audience. And this was this wonderful opportunity. So the mood was so good on the bus and everything. And, and this was back early. This is when Diana was still on the bus. And, you know, she, she's a, a diva and everything, but she's also real funny. And you get her and Mary Wilson together, and now you've really got funny because Mary Wilson will take the piss out of her any day. So this was all part of the experience of being on this summer tour. And we did uh, alternate somewhat between uh, Chitlin Circuit type places and established, uh, you know, maybe a theater about the size of we're sitting in now, you know, not, not, nothing crazy. We're not, no soccer stadiums or anything. <laughs> it, it, sound systems didn't do that. so. But we had a wonderful uh, summer. Yeah. Were there any, because it was um, a racially mixed groups, you know, traveling and performing together, did, were there any issues like that? Um, well, with, we were idiots. Uh, and so we probably needed this, the uh, sensitive help of several of the band members uh, of the Motown Orchestra, who uh, only on certain dates we'd finish the date and we'd go, uh, we'd be, you know, all ready to go, yeah, hi, dear, uh, what's your name? And all of a sudden, this horn player would be going, get, get on the bus, get on the bus. No, 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 don't, don't change your clothes, get on the bus. And, you know, we're kind of going, what is going on? And we never found out because they knew what they were doing. And so nothing precarious uh, ever happened. Uh, but that was really just the, you know, the, the goodwill of that ensemble of wonderful players yeah. and the great, great job they did looking out for the Love and Spoonful. Yeah. Um, John, during the uh, week of this taping that we're doing, you're, you're in town to play the Grand Old Opry, and I'm curious, have you, have you ever played the Opry before? Uh, you know, I've, I've played the Ryman, and I did play the Opry, a kind of abbreviated thing. I think the Hank spot had already been moved, because I remember <laughs> commenting on it. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I have briefly uh, played both of those venues. Yeah. And has, did the guy who wrote Nashville Cats, has he, have you actually ever recorded in Nashville before? So. I had to wait until Tony Jackson yeah. called me in to recut Nashville Cats. And we ended up in this room full of, you know, it's, it's the Paul Franklin level of pedal steel and everything else, too. Uh, so it was a remarkable afternoon. And oh, my God. I think I had already left when Steve Cropper shows up and goes, you know, I want to put something on there too. <laughs> so I, it just was so Nashvillian. Oh, and, uh, and a, a, a day later, Paul Franklin calls up and says, you know, I'm going to get on an earlier plane. I'm out here somewhere in Oklahoma doing a gig, but I'm getting an earlier plane so I can come in because I want to, 
I want to correct one thing on that solo. And I, that was when I went, right, this is how obsessive, to be the best, this is what it takes. Yeah. And um, you're, you've got a new, new album coming out with Arlen Walth, and I want to thank Arlen for being here today and performing with you. Absolutely. Whew, what a fantastic musician. <laughs> no, we oh, yeah. had a lot of fun together, too, yeah. And I, I heard him referred to as an accompanist, and that sort of isn't the flavor of this project, really. We've really been start to finish doing it together, and it was Arlen's idea. He says, have you ever done like an instrumental version of the Spoonful songs? <laughs> I never did that. So that was really the beginning of that project. And when did you two first meet? In Boy, we, we go back a pretty long way because, see, we've both been accompanists before we were visible artists. And I think that we crossed paths on stages in those jobs uh, long before anybody knew either of us. And, and the, the way that this just happened was, again, we were looking for guitars in Lower Manhattan a lot together, too. So our friendship just sort of kept uh, rolling along. And, and then uh, this one particular uh, afternoon, when I now had three or four of Arlen's CDs and was saying, you know, this is such a good idea to have an acoustic approach to an electric band or something, you know? And so, uh, so he reminded me that I was an idiot not to do this, and we got to work. Mm -hmm. And COVID had an, a weird effect on, uh, it, you'll see the album cover is the two of our, <laughs> our eight by 10 glossies ripped uh, because it, we got as far as the basic tracks with, uh, I mean, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful ensemble. It was just Ira Coleman on bass and Eric Parker on drums and uh, my son Benson on cajon and the, the various vocalists. I drafted Maria Muldor, I drafted Jeff Muldor to tenor me on jug band music because that's what happened. There was another thing we got, okay, we're making an instrumental album. Well, maybe we should just throw a vocal on this, you know, just sort of as a reference. It's okay. And that was what happened. There's three or four tunes there, maybe more, that, uh, that eventually got vocals. Uh, one remarkable one from Lexi Roth, uh, Arlen's daughter. She said, let me cut. Uh, didn't want to have to do it. She'd heard the track and uh, we thought it was going to be an instrumental track, but she did such a good vocal. The next day I spent erasing lots of harmonica parts until we got it back down to, yeah, she did a great job. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for coming to the Hall of Fame today. I've been really looking forward to this. And, um, and of course, you know, uh, you know, your song Nashville Cats gave us, helped give us the name of our of, of one of our uh, most successful exhibitions. So That's thank just you. so thank you hilarious. <laughs> If you are wondering what I'm gonna do while you are sleeping, am I sleeping too? Well, I'm just sitting here loving you, close my eyes and loving you. I'm just sitting back, sitting here loving you. I have been wondering just what I would do. If I weren't sleeping, had I not found you, well, I'd be outside finding you, walking all the avenues finding you, but I'm just sitting back, sitting here loving you. Now, there was never seen me running round, fingers on my forehead, calm me down. She can even get me up and on my feet. When I got to take care of some business on the street I have been walking all my streets alone 
I would keep walking, keep from going home. I couldn't quite clearly can see me. Now I can't see that ever leaving you. But I'm just sitting back, sitting here loving you. Come on, Ireland. Now the reason never send me running round The fingers on my forehead calm me down She can even get me up and on my feet When I got to take care of some business on the street I have been walking all my streets alone I would keep walking, keep from going home couldn't quite clearly can see me Now I can't see never leaving you But I'm just sitting back, sitting here loving you Yeah, I'm just sitting back, sitting here loving you